afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Global Atheist News. This week's headlines. The World Council of Churches faces calls to expel the Russian Orthodox Church. Former Archbishop Rowan Williams joins a delegation to Ukraine. Pope Francis calls for a Holy Week truce in Ukraine. The murderer of MP Sir David Amos is found guilty. Nigerian humanist Mubarak Bala is jailed for 24 years. Writer Kumvi Virabhadrapa gets a death threat from Sahishnu Hindu. Canadian academics are harassed after criticizing Hindu nationalism. Atheist lawmakers block the anti-abortion bill pushed by religious extremists in Nebraska. Brisbane parents petition about Christian bias in school chaplaincy. Representative Lauren Bobart says, you should be 21 before you can come out as LGBTQ. And the Ark Encounter is not close to living up to its projections. The World Council of Churches is under pressure to oust the Russian Orthodox Church from its ranks, with detractors arguing the church's leader, Patriarch Kirill, invalidated its membership by backing Russia's invasion of Ukraine and involving the church in the global political machinations of Russian President Vladimir Putin. The WCC, a global Christian ecumenical group, was founded in 1948 in the aftermath of World War II. It has a major meeting of its central committee in June. With the war continuing to rage in Ukraine, where Russian forces have been accused of committing war crimes against civilians, a growing chorus of Christian voices is questioning whether the WCC should cut ties with what is seen as a complicit Russian Orthodox Church. Religious leaders from across the world including the former Archbishop of Canterbury and the Minister General of the Franciscan Friars, have travelled to Ukraine to demonstrate solidarity and friendship with those affected by the war. Lord Williams of Oystermouth, the former Archbishop, joins Brother Massimo Fusarelli, who heads the Order of Friars Minor, as well as Archbishop Nikitas Lulius of the Greek Orthodox Church in Great Britain. Other delegates include Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg of the New North London Synagogue and Muslim, Hindu and Buddhist leaders from a number of other countries. The Holy Father, Pope Francis, told the 65,000 pilgrims in St. Peter's Square that as we turn to the Blessed Mother with the Angelus prayer, we must remember how the angel of the Lord himself said to Mary in the Annunciation, nothing is impossible for God. He can even bring an end to a war whose end is not in sight, a war that daily places before our eyes heinous massacres and atrocious cruelty committed against defenseless civilians. The Pope reminded how Christians this Holy Week are preparing to celebrate the victory of Lord Jesus Christ over sin and death, noting the victory was over sin and death and not over someone else and against someone else. Christ died, the Pope stated, so that life, love, and peace might reign. Let the weapons be put down. Let the Easter truce begin. See this video.
Dei Onipotente, Padre e Figli e Spirito Santi. An Islamic State fanatic has been found guilty of murdering Sir David Amos MP. The South End West MP was stabbed more than 20 times during a constituency surgery in Leon C, Essex on the 15th of October 2021. A jury at the Old Bailey took just 18 minutes to convict Ali Harbi Ali of murdering and preparing acts of terrorism. The 26-year-old from Kentish Town, North London, had denied the charges and claimed he targeted the MP over his vote for airstrikes on Syria. He was detained by two plain-clothed officers from Essex Police, the first on the scene, who were armed only with batons and incapacitant spray. In a video that we showed in a previous Global Atheist News episode, which was shown to the jury, the officers were heard shouting, drop the knife, while the defendant was on phone to his sister. Wanting to be shot by police, he told the jurors that he dropped the weapon when he realised the officers, PC Ryan Curtis and PC Scott James, were unarmed. Both officers have received Essex Police's highest accolade, the Merit Star, for their bravery. Recalling when they arrived at the scene, PC James said, We couldn't stand outside if there was a chance other people get, were getting attacked. And we also wanted to get paramedics inside the building as soon as possible. Our biggest fear that day was that there were other defenseless people inside with Sir David Amos, waiting for the police to come through the door. So any fears we had were put to one side. Mubarak Bala, the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, was sentenced to 24 years in prison on Tuesday afternoon, two years after his arrest at his home in the North Kaduna state on 28th of April, 2020. Back then he was taken to neighboring Kano where calls for action against him had been made by members of the religious establishment in that majority Muslim and conservative state. Bala was de detained without charge for a year, during which his whereabouts were unknown and he was denied contact with his lawyer or family for months. A high court in the capital, Abuja, ordered his release on bail but the ruling was ignored by the Nigerian authorities in Kano and Kaduna. Bala, the son of a religious scholar in Kano, is an atheist who had been an outspoken religious crit critic in a staunchly conservative region. He faced death threats and calls for him to be tried for blasphemy after he posted comments critical of Islam on Facebook in April 2020. In court on Tuesday, to the surprise of his legal team, Bala requested to change his plea to guilty. One of his lawyers said, just suddenly he changed his plea and pleaded guilty to the whole 18 count charges. We were in shock. The lawyer said Bala may have seen the guilty plea as a way to end the case. It feels like he felt he should just know his fate. He didn't know when this would come to an end. He may have thought a guilty plea would lead to some leniency, but the judgment was harsh. Leo Igwe, an associate of Bilal's and founder of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, said, following the case, Unfortunately, this is a very sad day for humanism and for human rights in Nigeria. The implication is not good because it means that humanists will be, by implication, criminals. Bala's detention and treatment has been condemned by Humanist UK and UN human rights experts. His case has been seen as an example of a clampdown on voices 
judged to be critical of religious orthodoxy in a deeply conservative region. Bala had previously been forcibly committed into a psychiatric facility after he renounced Islam in 2014. Following Bala's sentence, Igwe claimed that members of the religious establishment had likely threatened Bala to admit guilt. He was under pressure to admit he was guilty and that otherwise he could die in prison. It was impressed on him by authorities in Kano that the only way his family could be safe was if he admitted that he was guilty. So even against legal advice, he decided to agree and face the consequences. Senior Canada writer Kamvi Virabhadrapa, who recently spoke against communal divisiveness and hatred in Karnataka at an event in Bengaluru, has received a death threat via an anonymous two-page letter delivered at his residence. The letter not only threatens Kumvi, but 61 other writers, artists and activists who recently signed an open letter to the chief minister expressing concern over rising communal tension in Karnataka and former chief ministers Siddharamaya and H.D. Kumaraswamy, who have been criticizing the BJP and Hindutva organizations over the same issue. The letter says the 61 writers are anti-nationals, traitors to their religion, and asks them to prepare for their death, which may come in any form shortly. The letter is signed as Sahishnu Hindu, which is meant to be tolerant Hindu. Chinaya Yangam opened his computer and saw a cartoon of himself cleaning a white person's boots. The history professor at Carleton University in Ottawa said he received thousands of hateful emails like that over the past five years, along with abusive voicemails on his office phone. He said he has also been accosted in person by groups picketing his academic lectures because they disagree with his politics. Imagine every Monday you get up and see that picture, said Yangam. Half your day will go coming to terms with it. He closed most of his social media accounts in response, in part, he said, to try to shield his family. Jangam is one of several Canadian academics whose work relates to India, who say they are being harassed and threatened by diaspora groups for being critical of both the country's politics under Prime Minister Narendra Modi's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, and Hindutva, the right-wing political ideology it espouses. There is a growing violence against Muslims and Dalits, said Yangam, who is a Dalit, the lowest strata of the Hindu caste. It's a group previously called untouchables because their low status meant they weren't even touched by others. I come from that background. I have a social responsibility and also moral responsibility to speak out, said Yangam. In Nebraska, Senator Joni Albrecht's bill would have held doctors criminally liable for performing an abortion, jailing them for up to 20 years if convicted. The wording of the bill could also apply to doctors offering IVF treatments, since that can lead to the destruction of embryos. Albrecht's goal was to protect fetuses at all costs, no matter how much women would suffer as a result of their pregnancies because Republicans like her simply don't care about the health and well-being of those women. Conservatives have the majority in Nebraska, so it looked like the bill would pass. The bill failed. And with only a few days left in the legislative session, there are few options for anti-abortion zealots to mount another challenge 
to women's autonomy. It failed because senators like Megan Hunt, a champion of reproductive rights and an atheist, used their time to call out the harm this faith-based legislation would cause. See this video. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Nebraskans. First, I want Nebraskans watching to know that we are going to do everything we can do to stop LB 933, just as we have done our best to stop every anti-choice, anti-woman, anti-family, anti-science, extreme abortion restriction in this state. I can't promise what will happen. Um, I know that we will have at least three, we'll have three rounds of debate and we will do everything that we can to make sure that this extreme abortion bill does not pass in Nebraska. Today, Christian religious extremists, let's call it what it is, are trying to pass a forced birth bill in Nebraska to cut off abortion services, including for victims of rape and incest and child abuse, with no exception for the life of the mother. With few remaining days, we're on day 54 out of 60 now, and we're debating a bill that was pulled out of committee that has no committee statement, that doesn't have a committee amendment, that circumvented the norms of our processes to get it to the floor to ban abortion in every case by any means possible, at any cost. And that's the priority of your state senators. With few remaining days and with so many important challenges still in front of us, a controversial abortion debate brought on through a poll motion, through a procedural motion that was never voted out of committee, it's going to derail the rest of the work that we must do for Nebraskans. Colleagues, it's already derailed work that we must do for Nebraskans. As soon as this trigger ban, this extreme abortion ban was dropped in the first 10 days of session, it already started taking up oxygen in the room because we knew that in Nebraska we had a good chance of seeing this come through because of the conservative nature of this body and because of the abortion bans that have passed in the past. It should worry us, colleagues, and it should worry us Nebraskans, how often we have to debate human rights and dignity and how we have conceded that there's a debate to even have. The fact that my reproductive destiny, that my fertility, that my rights to control my own body and every other woman in this chamber is even up for debate is something I can't believe we have conceded as a culture. When we talk about the rights of trans children to exist, that's not debatable. When we talk about reproductive rights and reproductive justice, that's not debatable. When we talk about marriage equality, that's not debatable. When we talk about the rights of immigrants to work and drive and go to the doctor, that's not debatable. Let people live, leave people alone, and trust people in Nebraska to do what's best for them and their families and their lives, and that we have even seeded that these questions are debatable should concern us all. The decision about whether and when to become a parent, whether and when to start a family, is one of the most important life decisions that we make. And once someone makes the decision to end a pregnancy, their care should be safe and affordable and free from punishment or judgment. Every pregnancy is different, and that's why a one-size-fits-all law a one-size-fits-all ban like LB 933 has no place in our health decisions. This bill makes it a felony, punishable for up to 20 years, for a doctor to exercise their best judgment and their training, their years of training and experience of medical best practices in the most industrialized modern nation in the entire planet, we like to say, this bill would ask doctors to not use their best judgment and put their patients in danger or else risk going to prison for up to 20 years. 
The parents behind a 20,000 strong petition calling for changes to the National School Chaplaincy Programme to include secular youth workers want to remove religious based discrimination. In an interview on ABC Radio Brisbane this morning, petitioner Fiona Newton from the Fund Youth Workers, Not Faith Workers in Public Schools group said the major parties should remove the discriminatory requirement from the NSP, the NSCP. See this video. As well, would like to see um, the discriminatory requirement of um, being. So what we're asking um, the, you know, both parties, but um, particularly Labor hasn't made a stand on this in, in this area either is to, to say that they're going to remove this because it is discrimination. Um, you couldn't advertise a position based on someone being white or being female or, you know, that we, we somehow can have this requirement for funding about religious belief. It seems very strange, very odd. It's very much rigged and set up so that you have to be predominantly Christian and um, religious to access or be employed as a youth worker or as a chaplain in public schools in Australia. What would you like to see change? Well, I'd like to see that requirement. The people, the nearly 20,000 people that signed the petition as well would like to see um, the discriminatory requirement of um, being religious uh, removed uh, and also removing third-party providers from the situation. Uh, we, we believe that schools should have the right to employ and advertise for employment themselves and not have to go through a third party provider and then find the right person for their school themselves. Should be the best person for the job, you know, based on qualifications, based on experience, not based on our religious beliefs or non beliefs. So we're not saying pick Christians out of the schools completely. Uh, if schools want to employ someone that happens to be Christian or happens to be religious of, of some other affiliation, um, you know, that's fine. That doesn't disqualify anyone. All we're saying is, you know, someone who's studied, got the right qualifications, had experience in this area, uh, is the right fit for the school, they should be able to access the funding in exactly the same way. U.S. Representative and QAnon conspiracy theorist Lauren Bobart, Republican Colorado, stirred up quite a bit of controversy when she posted to Twitter, we require people to be 21 to purchase alcohol beverages and 21 to, pur to purchase tobacco products. Therefore, she texted, Americans should have to be at least 21 years old before they can come out as LGBTQ adding, especially as transgender. Then there's a question regarding at what age should we allow gun ownership? Representative Bobart was a really generous mum last year. She gave all her young sons assault weapons for Christmas. In 2013, the town of Williamstown, Kentucky, issued $62 million of junk bonds to get the ARC project off the ground. The deal was made even sweeter by the provision that 75% of what ARC Encounter would have paid in property taxes would instead go to paying off the loan. To secure such a sweet deal, Ken Ham and his colleagues came up with a feasibility study claiming that the ARC would attract 1.2 to 2 million visitors in its first year of existence with annual attendance increases of 7% per year over the next decade. So, how does the actual ARC encounter attendance measure up? Since its opening in July 2016, up to February 2022, the Ark Encounter has attracted in the neighbourhood of 4.2 million paid visitors. It's never come close to reaching the numbers projected in the feasibility report. 
It has never reached even the minimum number of visitors for its first year of operation. And with e every passing year, the tourist site falls further short of what Answers in Genesis promised. My Free Thought Hour guest this week is Chris Bartlett, who will talk on futurism. Where is science going to take humanity? Due to time zone considerations, it's recorded, not live, this week. It will be starting in a few minutes, so stay tuned to this channel. The GAN team will be back with our weekly news report next week. Tomorrow, our weekly news review will be screened. This is where our panel give their opinions, their views on the news. Please like, share, subscribe, comment and set the notifications. This has been Global Atheist News. Thank you for watching.